Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today from the great city of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, is my friend Michelle Hessler. Michelle, how are you tonight? I'm well, Chris. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm so delighted to have you with us here today. Um, it is Women's History Month, and to commemorate Women's History Month, I'm talking with a series of women who are involved in Civil War history, and Michelle serves as the Vice President of the Gettysburg Roundtable. And uh, so, Michelle, thanks for being with us. Thank you. So what's it like to be assistant vice chair, madam assistant president? <laughs> what title is it? <laughs> Well, it's 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 awesome. It's 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 a great thing, actually. Um, um, the civil, the Gettysburg Civil War Roundtable, is on a um, just an amazing trajectory right now. Um, we have so much energy. We have um, we have a new home in the Adams County Historical Society, which has nice been room. really <laughs> yes, which is really exciting for us. We had um, previously been in the Gettysburg. GAR Hall, which was um, very nice and quaint and historic, but it was also very cramped and it had no internet. And um, pre-COVID, when you were sitting in meetings in there, you were already sitting just elbow to elbow. And we were almost afraid to get more people attending meetings because we just had literally no seats for them. So now it's nice just to be able to spread out a little and have some great tech in front of us. and. And so being vice president is is re really been awesome as well. Um, it means kind of getting called on at the last minute lots of times to hey go up there and you know speak or moderate or um, <laughs> you know <laughs> take care of this. But that's okay. That's you know that's, that that gets better easier with practice. So I'm like okay, what what am I talking about again? But <laughs> so it's it's really um, but the roundtable itself is just really. I can't speak highly enough for what we've got uh, on right now. So now I'm sure there are listeners who are thinking Civil War Roundtable in yeah. Gettysburg, and they're green with envy because, of yeah. course, being in Gettysburg and you know the epicenter of the Civil War world, except right. for some people, um, yeah, is is it all that in a bag of chips to be in a Civil War Roundtable in Gettysburg? It it is. So, um, I, you know, obviously we've got a unique dynamic going on there you know I go around um to a lot of I visit a lot of different round tables um my husband's a frequent speaker at um Civil War round tables so I've been to a lot of ones and we were also um you and I were both at the Civil War Congress meetings this past August I believe it was and a common theme you keep hearing about roundtables today is, you know, we're just dying out. Our members are getting older. A lot of people didn't come back after COVID. We're having trouble recruiting new people. And, um, and you know, you just hear that almost everywhere you go. And I feel like the Gettysburg Roundtable, um, it's, it's got a couple of things going for it. It, it was a struggle during COVID, I'm not going to lie. Um, again, we um, we just could not remain in that GAR hall as much as everybody loved the building. It just was too um, small in there. But once we, and the early days, as for everyone of trying to get Zoom and tech and video up and running were pretty darn rough, I'm not going to lie. Some of the, some of the early meetings our, our video was literally me sitting in the front row holding up my cell phone. And that's that's what would go out to the world. And then you'd get all these complaints saying, I can't hear the speaker and stuff. And like, we're doing the best we can, <laughs> we can hear. Or, you know, you, we lose lose the feed midway through. And, well, and, that, yeah. and that's like people join roundtables because they like the Civil War, not because they like to do tech. You know, I mean, so yeah, learn that stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So it was it was pretty um, it was pretty rough at first, but once we once we finally got it sorted out, and I have to say our interim um, venue in between the JR Hall and the ACHS um, building, we were um, at the Methodist Church in the interim, and I can't uh, the Gettysburg Methodist Church, and that's another organization that I truly can't 
speak speak well enough of, you know, they invited us in, they said, hey, come for free, you know, come have your meetings here. They let us use their video link. And um, so really they, that, that was a great lifesaver as well. But once they finally got it figured out and it probably took us a good six months to really get it working on a regular basis. But once we finally got it, um, figured out what emerged was that we started getting, and I know a lot of this is the Gettysburg name, is we started getting visitors from literally all over the world. Um, we said we had so many people say, hey, I love Gettysburg. I'm so excited that I can be here, even though I'm not, you know, physically there. Thank you so much for doing this video. You know, we really appreciate it and so forth and so forth. So it actually grew our membership. Um, we probably had about 200 members um, pre-COVID. We're probably up to about 250 nice. now. And that ranges probably 60 to 70 physical in a meeting, and then another 30 to 40 online. So um, so that that was pretty exciting as well. And obviously, just Gettysburg is just such a special place. And you always have so many. And we always, we kind of laugh because our, our, you know, obviously there are the citizens of Gettysburg who live here um, and who, um, you know, because this is where they're from and everything. And then there's the Civil War world <laughs> over here, you know. And we always laugh because all of our friends, nobody, nobody is from here. Everybody, including us, moved here because you just wanted to live here, you know. And with the, you know, with remote work and stuff these days, that's made that possible for so many people just to come either retire here or to come here and live here when you're younger. And it's just it's such a special place and it's just such a great place to immerse yourself. You know, and every every weekend there's walks and talks and um, events happening all over town, and it just seems like that just keeps growing. That there's so many, so much stuff to do here all the time. So, because it seems to me that that there could be so many different factors that would affect the or could affect the roundtable. You know, as you yeah. said, there's a lot of competing programming. So maybe oh, yeah. I want to go to roundtable because I can do this. Or it's like I'm immersed in it all the time. I don't want to spend my free time in the evenings doing it. Or hey, I can go to the battlefield anytime I want. And 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 so like with this swirl of different factors, yeah. you guys managed to to continue to grow and thrive and and do some cool stuff. Um and that, I, I, I congratulate you guys for that at a yeah. time when a lot of roundtables are struggling. Right. Um, so uh, the, tell me like what's, what's a typical meeting like for you guys? Um, it's, we, we try to keep it not too long um, because in, in general, you know, and as much as we do have younger people joining, and I think certainly probably a larger, younger population than you see in a lot of roundtables, um, um, by by and large, our um, our membership is older, you know, and they don't they don't want to be there for three hours or anything. So you know, um, so um, so generally, you know, we'll we'll just start out with a with a business meeting. Um, we try to keep that brief. Um, you know, we we kind of we will, you know, we'll do we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance and then we will um have our have our new have a guest um be identified and um stand up and everyone will applaud for them because we want everybody to feel we don't want we don't I don't ever want anyone to feel like they're not you know if you don't know enough about the Civil War we don't want you here or anything. You know I want everybody to really um feel welcome there and just have a place to go in a community. So we we always make it a point to welcome our new members or any guests we might have that night. Um, then we'll do a brief treasurer's report and then our um, programming chair will get up and talk about what's coming up in the next meetings, you know, who's coming up in the next two or three meetings. And, you know, he always has such a great lineup for us of just different topics and things we're going to talk about. 
And then um, Bruce Davis, our president, he will do either, he, he the past year, he's done a brief history of the round table and going back over various years and who was the speaker back in 19, you know, March, 1974 and, um, you know, what kind of controversies, if you will, or <laughs> excitement was going on. You know, he has all these old um, board mini meeting minutes and stuff that he's been kind of going through. Or we'll do what, a, what we call a brief um, five minutes with where um, you, we just have a very brief, you know, a little nugget of information somebody wants to share. Um, I think the two meetings ago we had um, a woman who had written a book about a battlefield guide. And this is just a horrible story, but a battlefield guide that had actually gotten murdered while he was taking um, some some um, clients out on a tour. Um, and then um, the past meeting in honor of Black History Month, I actually talked about the history of the um, Underground Railroad song called Follow the Drinking Gourd, which was um, which is a traditional African American folk song that gives a history that gives you directions for escaping from the um, Gulf of Mexico down in Mississippi. And uh, I'm sorry, Alabama, not Mississippi, and what rivers and stuff you take north oh, up wow. to the Underground Railroad. So that'll be a brief, just, you know, we usually try to get all that done by 15, 20 minutes after. And then we'll have a speaker and we ask them to keep it to 45, 45 minutes. Some of them are better about that than others. <laughs> um, and then if, assuming there's time, we'll um, have some questions and stuff. And we try to wrap up everything by about 8.30 or so. Now, now, I will say about roundtables, you know, going back to the, you know, having a sense of community and wanting everyone to feel welcome. I know that then, you know, previous to the meeting starting and afterwards, you know, um, people will stand there and talk and visit and see friends and meet new people. And I think that's just part of, you know, more a part of just trying to ever make everyone feel welcome and a part of things. And I think that's an important um, aspect to it is just the social sure. um, meeting, just have, you know, perhaps somebody to meet other people and maybe you're new to town, you don't know anyone and just um, to be able to kind of get out there into your community. Now, you guys do any Gettysburg related topics or do you do outside of Gettysburg topics because you already have a lot of Gettysburg? Yeah, we have, we do both. Um, during the summer months, so during, um, June, July, and August, we actually get out onto the battlefield and we do walks out there. And those are generally with a battlefield guide because um, technically you can't take a tour without a battlefield guide present. So those tend to be very Gettysburg centric. Um, it just depends on the speaker. Our program chair, um, Roger Heller, he does a, just a great job. And I know he spends a lot of time um, researching different speakers and topics and looking up for different people. Um, so he tries to alternate. It's his it's his goal to kind of alternate between more technical battle, either Gettysburg or other places, topics, um, and more of, you know, I don't want to say lighter issues, but just, you know, less battlefield centric issues. And just to kind of give everybody a variety, I would say it's probably maybe 50-50 Gettys. So, I mean, I, I'll say for myself, and, you know, my husband always laughs at me because I'll say for myself, anytime you're discussing Gettysburg or any battle, you know, I don't, I, I really just don't care who, what troops were standing gotcha. on the hill and facing in the what direction. I just, you know, I'm glad somebody knows this stuff. I, I just don't. <laughs> care and you know, that's of zero interest to me but if you want to talk about like tactics or politics or socioeconomic issues i'll do that with you all day you know so <laughs> <laughs> 
but that's why a good program chair is so important because then they can mix it up and, and find oh yeah, yeah yeah you know and having said that even though i can't say i've ever come away from a program not having learned something and you know even if it's not a topic that super interests me i always always enjoy um coming out there and listening to it and you know i know these speakers they a lot of them put so much time into putting these programs together and you know it's definitely a labor of love you're not gonna you'd be hard pressed to make a living doing this stuff so i know you i know you are but you know what i mean so <laughs> uh, hardly, but, huh? so i just you know i'm just so grateful for anyone who's willing to put themselves out there and come out yeah. and do this well, and, of course. and and like i think gettysburg in particular where there are some people who are just very fixated on gettysburg and oh right I've done the whole life studying gettysburg and then you say well what happened on you know july 12th well i don't know you know and so like yeah <laughs> getting people to, to to get outside of their wheelhouse with things look that, at the whole picture yeah yeah you know so i think that that's really cool that you guys yeah that conscious effort so let me ask you um you know obviously one of the the criticisms or, or one of the stereotypes of the field is that you've got a lot of older white men and i can't yeah. criticize that too much i'm going to be an older white man someday myself um but you're a woman in a leadership right. position in a field right. that has a lot of older uh, meant to it. Um, what's it like to be in that sort of position? Um, I it's it's no. I, I don't think it's any problem. I don't. I've never had anyone be anything but completely gracious to me. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think it's. I think it's good. Um, you know, and gosh, I hate to go stereotypes here. But, you know, I, <laughs> I think women, organ, you know, kind of organize the, the world at times. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's not a stereotype. That's just a fact. You know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know I think that's, you know, <laughs> I think that's in our, in our wheel, wheelhouse to kind of do that, you know, administrative kind of functions, making sure everything's running and the trains are running on time. So... You know, I, I think, um, I want to say our, I'm trying to look, think, count over our board here. I, I bet our board is about 50, 50, um, you know, and I think, you know, and I think a lot of the reason, you know, you don't see younger people maybe in some of those board positions and stuff is, hey, you know, you know this, when you've got when you're working full time and you've got little kids at home and you just, you just don't have time, you know, you're, I understand why you're not, you know, people complain that, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. Again, it's all old, old white guys coming to these meetings. Well, you know, younger people, you know, and moms and stuff, a lot of them just don't have the bandwidth and with for that. And I don't, I don't blame them. You know, when my kids were younger, I was more worried about, you know, getting someone to basketball practice than coming to, to a meeting. So, um, but I certainly would say that I've never seen a woman be, you know, felt unwelcome as a woman. We've had many female speakers. Um, I, you know, I, I really don't see it as, that big a, a deal so and certainly when you see um a lot of our new members are women and again it's um you know a lot of people who aren't from here and I think it's a great way for them to meet people so so tell me a little bit about your own civil war journey how is it you know what's your civil war origin story oh <laughs> um, it was it was mostly with my husband, um, you know, Jim Hessler. He's a big Civil War historian, and um, he, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna ask you about him in just a second. But okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, he's so you know, I was, deserves his own question. I was I'm a military brat. And I've kind of I've lived all over the United States, and um, you know, and my my parent, you know, we're. You know, when you kind of you know, we kind of look at that movie Vacation and you see, you know, you laugh at, you know, Chevy Chase and, the, and, you know, in the back of in the station wagon with the kids and the dog in the car. And I feel like that was really kind of me growing up because, you know, my parents would 
you know, we'd be driving from California and they just put, um, yeah, my brothers and I in the back back seat with two dogs and you're just rolling around out there and, you know, and the joke where Chevy Chase says, hey, let's go look at this ball of dirt out here. It's only 200 miles out of the way. Well, that was kind of like my, my parents. They were always, you know, let's go see this board or let's go, you know, check this out and stuff. So they were always very willing um, just to go inspect different things. And sometimes you'd get to a port and say, okay, this is just completely boring, but you know, sometimes it was, it was really cool. So I think I was exposed to a lot of that um, sort of vacation sort of travel stuff as a kid. And then, uh, you know, and then um, Jim and I, 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 we were, you know, in our early twenties, kind of when we, we got together and um, we were kind of looking, you know, for students. So we were kind of just looking for different places to go. So again, we would just kind of go check out different ports and, um, you know, he lived, he lived in Buffalo up north near Fort Niagara. Um, I actually went to high school. Um, I finally quit moving around when I got to high school and I went um, up in Rome, New York, up in upstate New York. And we have Port Stanwix, which is a revolutionary port right in the middle of town there. And, um, but so when Jim and I started, um, we would always, you know, for weekend trips and stuff, we'd kind of go again, just go check out various places. And um, I was, I'm a big reader of historical fiction. So I always enjoyed that. And Jim said, well, you've always got your nose buried in a book. I'm going to start reading as well. So he's, you know, he, he reads more nonfiction, but that's okay. Um, and so, and then when we, our son was born, we were living in Dallas, um, Texas, and we wanted to come back up to the Northeast here and kind of be closer to family, but we didn't want to be right with her. <laughs> so, so Jim, <laughs> yeah, so Jim had gotten a job in Philadelphia and um, outside, like kind of Northwest of Philadelphia. And when we were supposed to be, we had come here a couple of times to Gettysburg previously for the weekend and stuff, but we were looking for a house and this is in, uh, I think the summer of 2000 and we were looking for a house there. In, well, we were supposed to be looking for a house there in, in, outside of Philadelphia. And instead, when we were supposed to be doing that on weekends, we kept coming here to Gettysburg. <laughs> we kept saying, oh, we really like it here. We should retire here someday. And finally, I said, look, why don't we, you know, if we like it so much, why don't we just get a house here now? Let's just do it. We're going to move here and um, we'll just get you a little studio apartment for a while. And he would go there Monday through Thursday and come back to Gettysburg and, um, and so that's that's what we just we just did. So um, we said, let's just make our retirement dream. Let's do it now. And we just love it here. And, um, you know, and there's just it's just such a special place. And it was a great place to raise the kids and stuff. And then, um, you know, but those early years, you know, I had two toddlers and we didn't really know many people. So we didn't really get out much. So we would just go for out. We would go out for walks like on the battlefield every Sunday. And he started reading more and more. And then he heard, he found out about the um, the licensed battlefield guide exam. And he said, I think I'm gonna try and do that. So um, so that, that kind of even got us out even to more lectures and taking tours and stuff like that. And even more immersed in that. So that's kind of how that like, like moving there would be like drinking from a fire hose. If you were yeah. a civil warfare in because it's just like there's so much how, how did you navigate like what to decide to pay attention to oh that's i mean we were we were really big on walking um we 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 went back for a while we we would get up and walk every sunday that kind of didn't last forever but you know <laughs> but um so we we used to just like go walk and check out different parts of the battlefield um, I would I will say like in the early two thousands, and obviously this is before video or the internet. Really, um, you didn't have much of the internet, you know, dial up internet. I actually was working from home. I started working remotely. I'm like the original remote warrior, 
and, <laughs> and I actually had died. We had a second phone line installed and I had a dial up internet connection into my office, if you can believe that, <laughs> in those early days. So, um, but back in those days, other than over at the, um, back in those days, the old visitor center, there wasn't a whole lot out there, certainly not as, as much as there is, there is these days. Um, so it's always exciting, like around the anniversary of the battle and stuff, because you would have all these battlefield walks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I said, and again, it was, you know, somewhat constricted by by having little kids and not really having anyone around to, you know, you'd have to bring them with you <laughs> when you came places. So, um, but but yeah, now nowadays, you know, as you alluded to, it's there's just sometimes it's like, oh, this lecture's over here on Saturday at two, and this one's over here at one, and boy, that sounds like a really good topic. But we're going to be out of town that weekend, and you know, and it's just there's just so much out there. It's kind of yeah, right. It's kind of overwhelming, and certainly during the beginning of COVID, then I felt like it became the you know the competing videos right. events every night you know on thursday nights there would be like three different things you could go yeah i mean there's such a wealth of content i mean we're we're literally producing some right now yeah right there's such a wealth of content and and when i hear people say like oh interest in the civil war is is drying up but like it seems like there are more venues and ways to experience and interact with the war now yes than ever before yes well i certainly think it's changed since we first when we first came here it was very um book heavy reading um if you really wanted to learn about the civil war you you read about you read you know you went to cake lectures or cake in-person lectures occasionally but you mostly read books and we talked about it now how how much that has changed and i'm not saying people aren't reading still but i think just and certainly i feel like this is what we're seeing is you're seeing this younger crowd and of course by younger i mean anyone younger than me but you know so really, someone in their 40s therefore is, is younger right certainly i think the the way you and in, in material has just changed so dramatically in the past two decades. You know, now it's it's all about, you know, the the FaceTime videos and um, you know, the or the Facebook live videos, I guess, and yeah, zooming and um being out there on the, you know, on the hip, being out there with the hip, you know, people leading tours on the field and how many likes can you get? And it's much more of a sound bite kind of mentality than I think kind of what you and I probably grew up on if if you will. So and again as someone who produces a lot of that sort of content, yeah, yes. you know, I understand its value in hooking people's interest, but you know, I can only do so much in a three minute video or we can do only so much in a 40 right. minute interview. Whereas you know, you read a book and you've got really great levels of detail that you just yeah. can't in digital. Oh content. yeah. Yeah. So speaking of digital content, so here I'll, I'll ask about your husband, Jim, who is yeah, one yeah. of my favorite and, and most entertaining people in the Civil War world. I'm a big Jim Hester fanboy. Um, he's Civil War famous. What's it like to be married to someone who's Civil War famous? <laughs> it's, it can be weird sometimes. <laughs> yeah. tell, me, tell me about that. Yeah, so you'll just be, um, I think when one day we were walking down the street, just our street, just going for a walk um one night um and some guy coming the other way was just walking his dog and he overheard us and he said aren't you from the battle of gettysburg podcast and he hadn't even he didn't even know what um he didn't even know what jim looked like he the just voice. recognized his voice from walking down the street and you know and um i've had um you know, Wayne Motts, I've heard the same, you know, um, 
his his wife Tina had one time told me told me um she said oh you know he's he's got he's on some of those DVDs that you tours that you play in the car you know and she said oh it used to be it would it's so weird when you're just walking down the street and you hear your husband's voice <laughs> coming out of the <laughs> um coming out of the car you know and so so that's kind of yeah so it's definitely weird or people um coming up to us in in restaurants and stuff which you know obviously some of the restaurants in town you know that that's part of why you're there because you know everybody but you know it's um it, it's definitely different you know and um we always we always laugh because um you know, obviously, one of his favorite topics is sickles, and you—you—he's a pretty salacious. I assume most people probably know the history, but he's a pretty salacious character. So you've got you know murder and adultery and <laughs> and um, you know all sorts of good stuff going on there, and we always laugh because. It'll sometimes be when he goes and speaks on that topic, it'll be like the the sweetest looking little old ladies will come up to you and say, oh, that was so good. I really, really enjoyed hearing about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's it's definitely, um, so, sometimes it's, I don't want to say irritating, but it feels like, okay, I, I, so he'll, he'll do have a Facebook post about something personal and family related that really has no reference to the civil war about the kids or something that just has no nothing to do with the civil war it's just about our family and you'll get comments talking about sickles and stuff and you're kind of like all right people let's just give it a rest for it <laughs> yeah. my wife is the same. she's like yeah 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 whatever you know yeah like, <laughs> uh, and she has no interest in civil war history at all and yeah it's probably a good thing for our relationship. How right. does that affect your dynamic though? I mean, cause you're both interested in the civil war. Is that something that, that brings you guys together? Do you find your own pathways? Tell me about that dynamic. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Um, you know, I enjoy, <clears throat> I enjoy going to different places with him and going to, you know, going and speaking, you know, being with him when he goes and speaks to different round tables. And again, I've I've never gone to a round table, whether it has, you know, whether it's in Kentucky and it has 300 people at the meeting or it's, you know, somewhere, you know, more obscure and it has like 20 people there. I'd say, I can't say I've ever been to a meeting where I haven't thoroughly enjoyed. Um, everybody is always so gracious and welcoming and they're just so glad, you know, just like I was saying, I'm so glad our speakers have come and I think everywhere you go people are just so glad that you came and you're out to speak so I, I do enjoy doing that um it, it is it's stressful at times because you know Jim's already working we're both working nine to five jobs you know during the day um we both work remotely now so we're both here in the same house all day which could probably be a challenge of its own right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I, you know i'm i'm downstairs he's upstairs you know <laughs> when the the kids both came home from college during the um during the pandemic then you had all four of us trying to be, be on the internet at the same time so that that was a little tense at times <laughs> um but then on weekends then you know he can be out all day doing a tour or something so you don't see much of him and because he's he's working so many hours in so many weekends sometimes it's hard to plan you know non-civil war stuff just to get away for the weekend I feel like I have to go put it on his calendar like six months in advance and block it out and say okay I'm gonna go do this instead so it does feel sometimes like you can like never never get away from it <laughs> you know um but uh, you know i think um you know we have we certainly have some different interests you know i am um i said i'm a big walker i had spent um from september 2019 
till about January 2021. I walk 10,000 steps a day for every single day. So I'm a big walker. I'm a big reader of fiction and not necessarily Civil War fiction. So, um, you know, and I like doing, I'm a data analyst, so I have nothing to do with, in my work, so I had absolutely nothing to do with history or <laughs> anything like that. And, you know, I'm a big puzzle person. I'm a big Wordle. And Me too. I love Wordle. Do it every morning. Yes. I, I missed it on, I was so sad I missed it on Saturday for the third time ever. Wow. I had a lucky guess and got on the first guess a couple of weeks ago. Ah. Uh-huh. Just yeah. a, a lucky guess. You know, all it is. <laughs> uh, so, um. What advice would you recommend for people who are are interested in in trying a roundtable for the first time, or they want to go oh. explore a battlefield, they don't know how to do it? What advice would you give to to help them feel more welcome? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Well, I would definitely, um, you know, every well, let me say most roundtables, and this is true of Gettysburg or any any city you're in. Um, they they have a they have a web page or a um or a Facebook page or um I don't know most of them have Instagram pages I don't think we do I know I know my my kids say only old people are on Facebook but <laughs> I know Instagram that's, and that's our clientele right <laughs> TikTok <laughs> where it's at now but <laughs> but you know look look up on the page and see when the meetings are um if they have a you know, if they have a um, email address or, you know, a, a messenger address there, definitely check in. You know, I, I would say that anyone that wants to come join Roundtable, you know, it's been my experience that we are just so thrilled to have you. So really, um, you know, whether it's here or, you know, in Ohio or, you know, down in Virginia there, it, no matter where you go, I think I can, you know, they're just so pleased to have you. We find we get most of our new members, if you ask them, say they came because some a friend of theirs was already in the round table and their friend said, hey, why don't you come check this out? Um, and while you're there, you know, don't be shy if you, um, if, if somebody... Certainly, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, can you introduce me around, um, I, I would love to do so, you know, and after the meeting, stick for, stick around for a few minutes and chat and, you know, um, we would, we would love to have you. And if you're, if you're interested, again, just um, start looking at some of the talks and walks that are around if this topic is of interest to you. You know, the Visitor Center, um, Adams County Historical Society, Seminary Ridge Museum, all those places, Heritage, the Heritage Center here in town, all those places, um, they're online. You can just check out their web page and see what lectures are out there and just go to something that interests you. Um, and then, you know, if there's a book that really, if there's a topic or something or a book or something that calls to you, just you know, go get a book and, and, and check it out. So, um, you know, I, I, I would say, I know it's hard to put yourself out there sometimes, but I would say just, you know, please just come along and it's, it's a very friendly group. So before we wrap up, I'm going to hit you with a couple lightning round questions. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what's your favorite spot on the Gettysburg battlefield? Oh, that is a good one. Um, I would say either little um, little round top, which is closed right now, or um, Culp's Hill. I like to do um the loop around Culp's Hill there. If you start out um at the middle school and you can do a loop around it, um, that's just a little under three miles. That whole loop there. So I, I really out in the hot sun though. Take water. <laughs> well yeah <laughs> and cope silk is pretty hilly in spots so <laughs> through the advertising there though i mean they're not yeah. it's Culp's hill right <laughs> uh, do you so, have a favorite uh, civil war site 
uh, that's outside of Gettysburg. Oh, well, that's another good one. Um, probably Fredericksburg. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I really, really like it. I'll give you points for that answer. Okay, I know, I know. <laughs> You're not too far from there. Since, since so, later. yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Civil War book? Probably, probably not. Um, I read, I probably read Gone with the Wind, I don't know, 20 times. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'll go with, I know it's not a true history book, but I'll probably just go with Gone with the Wind. But it won the Pulitzer Prize, and yes. it's done more to bring more people to the Civil War than maybe anything, you know, prior to God's intervention. Yeah, you know, and it's very, um, I think I read once that it's got all these, you know, and even the movie doesn't have, I don't think the movie, in the movie is good, but I don't think it's as good as the book, no. you know, but I've read the, I've read somewhere that the book has something like 50 fully developed characters in it or something. It's just truly, really, yeah. Good fiction. Good fiction. Yeah. So um, do you have a favorite Civil War monument? No, I don't think so. Okay. You know, I like I like the Indiana one and the cross. I'm not sure which one oh, that is. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then um last question, a favorite Civil War movie. Oh, Gettysburg. Okay. All right. Very yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Anything I haven't asked you tonight that I should have, Michelle? I don't think so. Okay, very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, uh, and then my last question for you then is uh, any bit of advice for a young woman who's interested in uh, exploring Civil War history as a as a either an avocation or a vocation? Uh, again, just find a find a topic that interests you. Um, start reading on it, and it doesn't have to be you know again whatever kind of whatever appeals to you. If there's a particular person or um, battle or something that appeals to you. And the next thing I would say is, hey, get out there on the field. There's there's really nothing like it. Um, you can you can read about it and watch, you know, videos about it all you want, but there's nothing to beat just being out there. Um, you know, walking down the streets of Fredericksburg and, you know, standing there on the river and, um, or, you know, over a little round top or across Pickett's Charge. And, you know, I think that really just gives you a great understanding Very of it. So, and, you know, and talk to people, you know, and if you want to, if you want it as an advocation, you know, I would certainly get out there and talk to people, um, you know, uh, there's plenty of people who are more than happy to be your, you know, unofficial mentor and, tell you all about what topics they know about or, you know, hey, why don't you go look over here? And so, you know, it's a great community of Civil War people out there. I agree. I agree. Well, Michelle, thanks for taking some yes. time to chat with me tonight. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of okay. fun. Yeah. Thank you. Best wishes and please pass along my regards to Jim as well. I will. Yeah. All right. Have a good evening, Chris. Thanks, you too. All right. I'm bye Chris Bukowski for the Emerging Civil War <laughs> Podcast. On behalf of Michelle Hessler, thanks for being with us. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.